Bom dia, boa tarde, depende de onde estamos cada um de nós. Um, vamos começar a entrevista da professora Jane Toswell, da Western University, uh, Western Ontario University, no Canadá. Um, como vocês provavelmente leram no uh, Facebook, vai ser uma entrevista em inglês com tradução ao português, que eu vou fazer eh, respondendo, um, continuando a discussão que a professora Toswell faça. E eh, temos o canal, o estúdio aqui, que vai ter perguntas no canal, e quem está em YouTube e quer fazer perguntas também, vai ter um momento para Q&A, para perguntas que vão ser, vocês podem fazer no YouTube e vão passar aqui a uh, ser traduzidas no que for preciso. Um, so, thank you very much, Jane, for agreeing to this interview. We're really excited to have you. Uh, and to learn more about how you got to this topic and um, all your trajectory and, and your future plans. So I had uh, sent some uh, questions. We're going to go through those and then open up as needed. Aí eu mandei as perguntas, vocês todos podem ver no Facebook, nós vamos continuar com elas. Aí vamos começar então com a pergunta de como a, a professora Toss will, uh, de onde ela vem, Uh, qual é o, o, a formação que ela tem, como chegou aos estudos de medievalismo ou neomedievalismo. Sim. Ok, <laughs> desculpe, um, eu não falo português. <laughs> um, so, I'm very sorry, um, I don't speak Spanish, or sorry, I do speak a bit of Spanish, I don't speak português. Um, so, I was born in North Bay, Ontario, uh, which is a good 220 miles north of Toronto. Um, we, it's, it's known as the gateway to the north, and it's one of the great uh, railway crossing um, spots in Canada. At least it used to be. It's not because we have fewer railways now. Um, but the result was uh, in North Bay, there, there's a very long winter and a very long summer. And uh, you either spend a lot of time outside or you spend a lot of time reading. And I went in the direction of reading. Um, uh, my family famously talks about the fact that um, I was 10 years old when my mother gave me her library card and I moved into the adult section of the library because according to the family lore, which is not true, I'd read all the books in the children's section. Um, as a result, I, I read a lot, um, and so I often find, especially with medievalism, that I'm remembering things that I read uh, as a teenager and thinking about uh, what they meant to me as a teenager. Um, so I guess to some extent, my love of literature and reading literature as much as I possibly can comes from that um, childhood opportunity to to play in a library, um, which uh, especially right now when we can't get into a library seems particularly a charmed existence. So I grew up then. Um, Let me translate that. A sure. sec. <laughs> um, então, um, a professora Toswell nasceu em North Bay, uma parte de Ontario, Canadá, que é ao norte de Toronto que é a parte onde começa realmente esse frio terrível, enorme do Canadá, e que tinha, era um centro também do que nesse momento era uma muito boa, um muito bom sistema de, de trens. Mas o que isso significa, sendo tão no norte do Canadá, ou começando o verdadeiro norte, é que tinha invernos muito longos e verões muito longos, e você podia passar muito tempo fora, muito tempo lendo, e ela escolheu a parte de passar muito tempo lendo, a parte da ideia, assim, da família era que ela, aos 10 anos, já já tinha lido tudo que tinha em casa e tinha que passar a, a biblioteca na parte de adultos da biblioteca da cidade. E que, então, o medievalismo para ela tem essa relação com as leituras que ela fez quando era uma adolescente e, e essa questão de, de poder passar toda a quantidade de tempo que quiser numa biblioteca lendo que justamente agora com o coronavírus é, é, parece uma, uma questão bem interessante e fora do comum. Jane. Thank you, Nadia. Um, so the the other thing that I did a lot as a child was music. Um, and so when it came to the time of going to university, uh, 
I, I basically had a choice between uh, the the languages, which I loved, and the literature, which I loved, or music. And the truth about music is that I really wasn't very good, um, which was a very great annoyance to my father when he discovered he'd been paying for lessons for six years, that I wasn't going to turn into a profession. Um, so, uh, so I went to McMaster University, which was not good for music, which was the first clue for my father. Um, and I took English and Spanish. And I was very lucky to spend my third year in Valencia in Spain and uh, particularly lucky that I was put in an absolutely horrible place to billet. And so I moved out within a couple of months um, and spent eight months with two uh, Valenciana roommates who spoke Valencia, um, which you will probably know is pretty close to Catalan. Um, but for me, they're very kind of cool. Castilian as well. So I have a couple of words in Valencia yeah. um, and uh, reasonable, at least I did have a reasonable facility in Castilian, um, which I which I love as a language. Um, I think it's marvelous. Um, and do you want to? Mm -hmm. Então, ela teve, junto com a literatura, uma outra possibilidade no seu momento pensada como profissional era a música. Ela fez, podia escolher literatura, línguas ou música, e a música eh, não era realmente o um nível que ela pudesse ser profissional nisso, apesar de que o pai tinha pagado muito tempo por eh, lições, estava um pouco triste com isso. Mas ela foi uma universidade que não era conhecida por música, McMaster, uh, e ela fez aí inglês e espanhol. Então já sabemos um pouco como é que ela começou a parte do medievalismo em espanhol tem uma, uma base do bachelor's, do BA, aí ah, também passou o seu terceiro ano em Valência, ah, nas, nas universidades dos Estados Unidos e de Canadá, os, os estudantes podem passar tempo fora, uma quantidade bastante longa, e ela esteve com um, valencianos, vivendo com duas valencianas, e aprendeu, então, além do castelhano de Castilha, o, um, a língua de Valência. Sim. Uh, thank you. And uh, then I, uh, in my fourth year, I applied for an assortment of scholarships because my family did not have the money that I could have gone on to um, further education. And I was lucky in that I got a Commonwealth scholarship and I had written such a complicated proposal that the British Council, which adjudicates the Commonwealths, couldn't decide where to send me, so they decided that they might as well just send me to Oxford. Um, so I did my graduate work um, straight after the BA. Um, I, I did a DPhil in Oxford. I was only in Oxford for three years. Um, and again, it was one of those fortuitous things. My supervisor said to me, you should apply for jobs. And I said, but I've I'm only in my third year. And he said, well, you won't get any, you don't need to worry, but you should have the practice of applying. And six months later, I went back to him and said, I've been offered two jobs. This plan did not work very well. Um, and so I, I took one of them, which was uh, the University of New Brunswick, Fredericton. I actually got my second job, which was here at Western, um, also before I finished my thesis. So it took me seven years to finish the thesis, but I like to argue that it was uh, five, four of those seven years were actually while I already had permanent posts. Um, so, so it was a complicated graduate life, basically. Então, a professora Tosso teve uma, uma, uma vida profissional complicada, mas muito, com muita sorte, eu acho. Um, no quarto ano da universidade, ela recebeu uma bolsa e acabou sendo mandada à Universidade de Oxford pela British, eh, pelo British Council, e eh, onde passou três anos, teve um, uma, um mentor que foi muito bom, que eh, falou para ela que ela devia pedir trabalho, já saíram a, a buscar trabalhos, ela recebeu duas uh, possibilidades de trabalho, já no seu, tendo estado só três anos em Oxford, e começou um e depois fez o segundo, passou o segundo à universidade onde está agora, no Western Ontario, então diz que ela levou sete anos para escrever a tese, mas quatro desses anos foram quando já tinha um trabalho acadêmico, eu estava ensinando na universidade. Thank you. And uh, so that's that's kind of, uh, I think that's basically the sort of 
background of where I am. Um, the result was that I, I, I worked in the field of Old English, Old English poetry, um, and I still do work in that field. That's my principal field. Um, but I learned fairly rapidly that uh, as an academic, um, I'm, an, I'm a magpie. I like looking at lots of different things and thinking about lots of different things. I'm constantly attracted to um, other newer, different things that I want to play about and think about. And so uh, it was never going to be possible that I was just going to sit down and do an edition of the Paris Psalter and then sit down and do an edition of the next Old English Psalter manuscript. I was always going to be doing a variety of things. And that is the way that my career has developed. Mm -hmm. Então, ela tem como base a um a poesia anglo-saxã, se direi, eu acho, em português, mas, ao mesmo tempo, ela nunca gostou de se manter no mesmo tema constantemente, nem nunca imaginou que seria uma das profissionais que faria uma edição crítica de um texto, depois passaria um próximo texto, depois o outro. Ao contrário, ela gosta de mudar muito de tema, sempre tem mudado muito a temática, tem feito uma coisa, depois outra, e assim, através, sempre tem mudado o foco That's kind of what I had for the, your first question. I'm, mm -hmm. uh, if I can, if I can take a little bit of that, did you did you really concentrate? Your education was really on Anglo-Saxon, on Old English poetry. Uh, the Spanish was sort of left to the side, together with the music. It, 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 while I was in Oxford, yes, because the Oxford system is very much about, uh, you know, learning one very small thing um at least at the graduate level they expect you to learn that one thing and uh, the thing that i learned at oxford was that uh even while they tell you that you just need to learn that one thing they actually expect you to learn everything so i would sit at high table and i remember this moment with horror to be honest because the person beside me turned to me and said oh you do old english and i said yes and she said so what do you think of jeffrey hill and i had I mean, bizarrely, I had actually taken a couple of books of his. He's a modern British poet. I had taken a couple of books out the previous week, so I actually had an answer for her. But I was looking at her in utter horror, thinking, "I, I would be, I would be finished if I didn't have an answer here." Um, so it, Oxford has that very contradictory. You know, you're learning this one thing and learn it right. But oh, by the way, you're supposed to know everything. Attitude that I I found exhilarating and terrifying at the same time. Então eu ampliei um pouco a pergunta para a professora Toswell sobre o que aconteceu com com o espanhol que ela tinha estudado antes um, se saiu do do panorama e ela explicou que em Oxford esperam que você que os estudantes estudem somente essa uma questão muito focada muito específica que era, no caso dela, a poesia anglo-saxã, mas, ao mesmo tempo, e aí onde também ela falava dessa história onde uma pessoa perguntou a ela sobre um poeta do século XX, ah, então, em Oxford, mesmo que eles queriam que a pessoa estudasse só muito focado, ah, eles tinham quase que saber de tudo o que estava ao redor, mesmo que fosse do século XX, eles estivessem estudando poesia anglo-saxã. E ela contou uma história na qual... É, teve a sorte de ter lido sobre uma, uma um poeta ao qual tinham perguntado numa num encontro especial de Oxford que se chama High Table e ela conseguiu responder mas ficou com essa sensação de, de que estavam pedindo demais e ao mesmo tempo a, a sorte de ter podido responder então a, passamos agora à segunda pergunta que é quando e como ela se interessou pelos estudos da Idade Média e como chegou a esses estudos Uh, so, Jane, I was um, translating and saying that we will go on to the second question. Um, how did you become interested in the Middle Ages or in medievalism or neo-medievalism and what led you to it? Um, I, I think partly because I like things that are difficult. Um, and the Middle Ages is, is a difficult period to study. Um, it's complicated and people think, uh, people who don't know about the Middle Ages the way that we do, um, think that 
it's a finite quantity of information available to us about the Middle Ages. So they don't think about the fact that archaeologists have been finding some really interesting things um, in the last while. And they also don't think about the fact that as, you know, as, as we learn more and as we think more, um, we, we can change perspective. And I really like changing perspective. I guess that's one of the things I like the most. Um, so, uh, so, for example, I was teaching this yesterday, um, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, and, uh, you know, we all talk about how uh, King Alfred probably commissioned the making of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, that it was done at Winchester, um, some people know, though not as many as should, that the first copy of it was done at the Nunnaminster. The Parker Chronicle comes from the Nunnaminster, and it belonged to the abbots at the Nunnaminster. And absolutely nobody has suggested, and I'm just going to say this, that it's, it seems to me quite possible that it was the nuns at the Nunnaminster who decided to do that chronicle and put it together. And w a hundred years ago, nobody would have thought of that because nobody would have thought that women in Anglo-Saxon England might have had their own agency. Um, and now that is something that we're thinking about and, and looking at and, and working our way around. So I, I like thinking about um, the difficult periods of time and uh, the Middle Ages is certainly difficult and it's certainly... Um, it takes a lot of work, um, but I find it deeply rewarding. And I think uh, the fact that I started reading in medievalism as a teenager um, and started reading about the Middle Ages as a teenager meant that when I arrived at Oxford and I really didn't know what I was going to be studying there, uh, I was drawn to the medieval side because it had so many complicated issues. I had to learn philology and paleography, and I didn't know what either of those words meant when I arrived in September, and I did exams on them in January. So, yeah, that's it's kind of accidental and fortuitous and serendipitous, and I'm looking forward to those words getting translated. <laughs> you must have noticed that I, I bypassed some other words <laughs> for, for the general meaning. I think serendipity will be one. Um, <laughs> É, estávamos aqui brincando como é que eu vou fazer uma tradução de certas palavras que são realmente bastante específicas e, e muito bonitas em inglês. Um, então, por que ela chegou à Idade Média e ao medievalismo? É uma mistura entre um, que ela gosta de coisas difíceis, e a, a Idade Média era considerada, é considerada como um período difícil e de alguma maneira complicado. E eu vou passar já para um, o que ela disse depois, a segunda parte dessa razão é que ela tinha lido muito medievalismo como adolescente, que é o que contou antes, passando muito tempo na biblioteca. Então, essa conjunção de dificuldade com um, um, um gosto que ela já tinha recebido das leituras de adolescência. Então, ao mesmo tempo, é, ela go gosta da Idade Média por essa dificuldade, e a ideia, talvez, que muita gente tem de que é um, um tema finito, um tema que é não há muita coisa nova, que só tem o que aconteceu, que você simplesmente aprende isso e vai para frente, mas que não é assim. Arque arqueólogos estão constantemente encontrando novas coisas sobre a Idade Média, e, ao mesmo tempo, temos uma, uma modificação nas perspectivas de estudo, que ela estava nos dando um exemplo de uma aula que deu justamente nesses últimos dias sobre uma crônica do uh, rei Alfred, que eh, ela começou a pensar que talvez foram as... Um, ah, aqui essa palavra eu deveria saber, se alguém me ajuda, são as monjas. Uh, the nuns, yeah. Mas em português. The, the, the nuns, yeah. Dizendo as monjas em espanhol. Ah. Uh. já vai ajudar. Um, e ela começou a pensar que talvez foram elas, foram essas essas mulheres no monastério. E que isso é uma modificação na nossa perspectiva, porque há 100 anos ninguém teria mesmo considerado a possibilidade de agência da parte das, dessas mulheres que estavam no monastério. Então ela se encontrou sempre atraída por essa questão da dificuldade e, e ao mesmo tempo... Um, por as leituras, e nos contava que, claro, chegou em, em setembro a Oxford, sem saber 
palavras como paleografia e filologia, e já em janeiro teve que fazer é, exames onde ela mostrava o seu conhecimento disso. Então, foi, ela encontra que Oxford foi um lugar, e aqui são as palavras divertidas e difíceis em inglês, que foi fortuito, é, quase uma sorte de que tudo isso tenha se encontrado no mesmo lugar. Um, thank you, Jane. So, this is one of the questions I'm most interested in, and it's your own, what I call the, the critical history of medievalism, um, and how, how do you see this field having developed, um, where, where did it come from in terms of your own experience with it? And then as a second, also big question uh, that I guess we'll leave for afterwards, is a very special congress in 2007 that led to a lot of talk and, and discussion um, that, you, that you put together on neo-medievalism. So the first part would be your own critical history of medievalism. How, how do you see that being developed? Wow. Um, yeah, this is a question I always try to skip. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so now I feel like I've been pinned on it and, and I have to answer, which is true. Um, I, I don't think that medievalism is the same thing as medieval studies. And I know that's uh, come to be a fairly popular thing. Um, but for me, uh, their intellectual values are quite different. Uh, and, and I have been thinking about this lately because in my own department, I can't actually manage to get my colleagues to understand that. They, they think when I teach Canadian medievalism, that's the same thing as medieval studies. And, I, uh, and part of the reason that I think it's impossible to articulate how they're different is, is the way in which we set up our disciplines. So that classical studies is just classical studies and nobody actually pauses to think about how uh, the historiography of classical studies affects us through the years. Um, but with medievalism, the way that I think about it anyway, um, it's alive in the Middle Ages and it's also still alive today, but in a very different way um, because it has now today this this amateur reliving of the Middle Ages and amateur love of the Middle Ages. Um, it, it, there's a wonderful passage at the beginning of Carolyn Dinshaw's How Soon Is Now, when she talks about going to a medieval fair in New York. Um, and she talks about just how much the people that are passing by her in that fair playing their version of medieval music and wearing medieval clothing and selling medieval crafts. Um, it's not a fair in which they have, you know, the Society for Creative Anachronism jousting, um, but it's a fair in which they they sort of replicate basically what might happen in a medieval village on a fair day. And her argument is that uh, there's such joy in the recreation that for her, that's a large part of thinking about medievalism is that kind of, uh, and, and she points out that amateur has as its root form amare, to love, um, and that uh, we, should, we should always keep in mind that when we talk about medievalism, we are often talking about that kind of uh, loved object that people think that they're recreating and that we as professionals in the field know that they're not really recreating, they're bringing to it their own approaches. Um, so for me, I've, uh, I've, I've had trouble with the extent to which everybody wants to define medievalism. Yeah. That is a lot of really important and uh, specific information. Um, então, isso vai ser é um pouco mais complicado, porque tem muitas coisas aqui uh, que são centrais. Uh, o primeiro é que ela não considera que o medievalismo e os estudos medievais sejam a mesma coisa, que é uma ideia que, que está sendo usada bastante na América do Norte. Ela considera que os, os valores intelectuais de, das duas uh, partes do medievalismo e dos estudos medievais são diferentes. Um, que ela encontra que até entre os colegas dela na universidade não é muito fácil de explicar essa diferença 
que quando ela ensina um curso sobre medievalismos canadenses, então como é recriada a, a Idade Média no Canadá, os seus colegas mesmos consideram isso como sendo parte dos estudos medievais, e que tem provavelmente a razão de que é tão difícil de articular essa diferença, como tem sido fundado, ou planificado, ou começado o, o que é medievalismo hoje, que fazendo uma a diferença ou fazendo uma comparação com os estudos clássicos, ninguém nos estudos clássicos tem que pensar realmente o que significa fazer a própria historiografia dos estudos clássicos, é simplesmente, é, são estudos clássicos e se fazem e pronto, né? enquanto que com o medievalismo é, tem essas duas partes e como são articuladas fica muito, muito mais complicado de, de fazer e que uma das razões pela qual, pelas quais a, a Idade Média é diferente é pelo nível de, de quase de paixão que se tem pela Idade Média, que essa é uma, uma situação que está sendo vista muito na Idade Contemporânea, que é, é, produz muito, um, uma emoção muito grande a Idade Média, como ela é recriada, e ela fala de um exemplo do, de um livro da Caroline Dinshaw, How Soon Is Now, que começa explicando que ela está dentro de uma recriação em Nova York, de uma feira medieval, e que o que ela mais nota nas pessoas que estão fazendo essa recriação, que é, é, é o amor que elas sentem, essa, essa emoção que sentem pelo... Uh, pelo período medieval e que nós, como estudantes do medievalismo, temos que reconhecer e nunca esquecer que eh, a Idade Média traz nos, nas, em aqueles que, que a recriam um, um nível de, de emoção que está também no, na palavra amateur, amador, é aquele que ama, que tem uma base de amor pelo que está fazendo e que nós temos que manter essa relação uh, com, com o medievalismo. Thank you. Um, do you want me to move on to the Congress at this point? Or? If you think that that's all you had to say about your own, I know it's a, it's a tricky one to ask. It's just really interesting. How, how do we see the field? Why do we see it in a particular way? Uh, so if, if you feel that that's that's what you have to say, then mm -hmm. I, I think I probably do have more to say, but I, I think it might better come from questions if people want to ask questions on that point. So, yeah, uh, I, I'll I'll move on to my my neo medievalism event. Um, Nesse caso, é, tem mais coisas para dizer sobre essa ideia de o que, que é o medievalismo ah, para a professora Toswell, mas que vamos fazer isso, então, na, na parte das perguntas, falar mais especificamente se houver perguntas. E agora ela vai falar do, do neomedievalismo, o congresso que ela ah, organizou em 2007. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, I, I started going to the the studies in medievalism conferences um, in the early 1990s. And uh, I found them fascinating. I, I found, for one thing, they were very British, um, partly because it was a British man who was organizing them and his American wife. And they were very focused on texts. They were very text-based. He was a medieval historian, Leslie Workman. Um, and so uh, there was some emphasis on history, but more there was a lot of 19th century american medievalism to some extent 19th century english well quite a lot to an extent on english medievalism and then there were the younger people who were talking about more modern topics but mostly also about books and uh and and sort of long form bits of medievalism and quite a lot of poetry and then i noticed gradually over the years that there was a group of people who really wanted to talk about i guess you could call them you know contemporary engagements with the medieval and they were starting to get specific sessions but they weren't getting serious let's look at this particular field and um since as i've already said i like to do things that i'm not good at um 
and, and actually I, I, I've never played a video game in my life and despite Carol Robinson trying several times um, but I decided well we should have a conference that explicitly looks at this modern thinking about the medieval and see where we can go um, and so I when the t my turn came to host the conference I thought this is where I want to go, and uh, and yes, it, it it gave. I think there was already developing some books um, and some book projects. Um, Carol and Pam's sort of important book on what neo medievalism meant to them, um, and then Carl Fugelso picked it up for several issues of Studies in Medievalism, so that uh, so that yes, it became a conference that uh, sort of reified what should already have been part of the field, um, really looking at, you know, very modern engagements with the medieval, um, starting with the video games, but they they move onwards into all kinds of incredibly cool things about which I still don't know anything, but I really was happy to give them a venue to think about it. Então, é, o que estamos falando é que a, a Jane Toswell, ela deu lugar ao que foi a um, conferência de 2007 sobre o medievalismo, que começou toda uma discussão muito importante sobre o que é o neomedievalismo, qual a diferença, a diferença, etc. Então, a história de como ela chegou a isso é que ela começou a ir às a, conferências de Studies in Medievalism no começo dos anos 90, ah, e que nesse momento essas conferências eram extremadamente concentradas em livros, em questões muito textuais, era muito britânico por causa do Leslie Workman, que é um historiador, era um historiador britânico, ah, tinha então um pouco de história, tinha também por causa da Kathleen Verduin, que é a, a, a esposa que é dos Estados Unidos, tinha também muito ah, século XIX, especialmente dos Estados Unidos e uh, da Inglaterra, e que ao mesmo tempo ela notou com o tempo que também tinha um grupo dentro dessas eh, conferências que queria fazer um medievalismo mais contemporâneo, que queria uh, ter algum outro tipo de, de aproximação ao medievalismo, uh, que não fosse também constantemente sobre livros e sobre poesia, que era o que tinha antes. Então, quando foi o momento para ela fazer a conferência, para ela organizar a conferência em 2007, ela decidiu dar justamente eh, lugar a esse grupo e fazer uma conferência sobre neomedievalismo, que eram um, justamente essas perspectivas contemporâneas. Ela já tinha nos explicado que gosta de fazer coisas das quais são novas, são diferentes, que não é que ela tem feito todo o tempo. Então, deu um espaço justamente para essa conferência, que acabou sendo uh, bom, um, um catalista de muitas outras coisas, um, entre elas várias, um, é, vários livros é, de reflexão sobre o que é o medievalismo e não o medievalismo do sim, dos estados em medievalismo. Uhum. I I also got, um, just to finish off on the conference, I got really lucky um, because Carol Robinson knew Terry Jones's email address. Um, and uh, as it turned out, he was already planning a tour of North America. And we managed to, actually we became the sort of, uh, the base leg, the anchor leg of the tour. He flew into Toronto and I picked him up at the airport. Um, and it was it was one of those glorious moments that everything sort of worked together because he wanted to talk about medieval studies. He wanted to talk about um, 14th century and attitudes to, um, notably to the to Richard III, but also other um, kings of the time. And, and of course the students and the faculty and the colleagues who came to that conference wanted to talk about Monty Python. So he found himself living uh, the, the connection between medieval studies and medievalism right there in the conference. And he was the most generous guest that I have ever hosted at Western. He was absolutely uh, open to all of the interviews the, the, and, and uh, just so kind. And I still remember the moment at which um, the the local newspaper uh, asked him a question. They hadn't 
been supposed to come. I'd offered three times and they hadn't responded. And then of course, being students, they'd suddenly arrived at the last possible second. We, we were hosting a reception in his honor next door and it was, it had been running for three quarters of an hour and he hadn't, hadn't got there. And, and this, and so I said to the student, you can only have one question. He, his answer in one sentence went on for 10 minutes. What a, a such a generous soul. So it, it actually meant that that conference has a particular kind of joy, I think, in people's memories because of him, because he was such a wonderful person. Can you tell the group that is in Brazil mainly uh, about Terry Jones? A, a little bit. <laughs> well, background, um, just, you know, basic things. It's not someone that will be known. Okay. Well, he was uh, he was a member of the Monty Python um, sketch comedy group, which actually started at Cambridge. Um, but he he himself had been at Oxford, so we did have that in common. And they started doing sketch comedy bits on British TV in the '60s, and then uh, it turned into some two longer movies. Uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, and The Life of Brian. I think there were actually three movies, but uh, they were all of those were conceived, largely written and certainly directed by Terry Jones. So of the five members of the troupe, and you would probably know John Cleese, Michael Palin, Eric Idle, uh, the other one was Graham Chapman, and I may be missing one and I apologize, but Terry was... Uh, really, the uh, a linchpin in the group, um, and uh, and and the funniest man. Um, and uh, he died in January this year, which is maybe why I'm thinking about him so much. And uh, he, he he was just funny. And but also after they finished the work of Monty Python, uh, he got interested in medieval studies as a scholar. And that's what he wanted to talk about when I met him in Toronto. We drove back, takes about two and a half hours to get to London, and he wanted to talk medieval studies. And when I said, you know, you're going to get lots of questions on Monty Python, he said, that's fine. I'm used to it. I can do that. But it's really nice to be able to talk about the 14th century. And I was looking at him thinking, I don't know that much about the 14th century, but I, I could just about catch up with him because he did he published a book on Chaucer's Knight um, and then he also published uh, jointly um, some other work on the 14th century. Uh, então, o que também fez essa conferência de 2007 muito especial é que um, todos aqueles que gostam de filmes ou de filmes uh, de neomedievalismo provavelmente conhecem o Monty Python and the Holy Grail and Life of Brian. Então, o Terry Jones, que era parte, ele morreu há muito pouco tempo, era parte desse grupo e era quem fez a, a concepção e a direção dessas, desses filmes, estava por fazer uma visita à Norte-América e aceitou falar na, a, nesse, nesse congresso de 2007. Ele queria falar de questões medievais do século XIV, do rei Richard III, um, de estudos medievais e os estudantes e todos os participantes do congresso queriam falar de Monty Python que era evidentemente o, o que estava mais relacionado com o congresso, mas ele foi realmente muito amável a, a James conta que ele é, aceitou todas as perguntas aceitou as entrevistas uh, foi deu muito de si do seu tempo e fez então que essa fosse uma conferência especialmente eh, importante, especial para todos, tendo uma pessoa tão de, de tanto renome fazendo parte dela. Um, acho que isso é basicamente. Uhum. Um, então, a nossa próxima pergunta é como ela saiu de todos esses temas ingleses e passou a ser uma das primeiras pessoas em trabalhar com temas latino-americanos, especialmente com Jorge Luis Borges, com o, um, o famoso escritor argentino. Um, então, essa é a pergunta. So, Jane, um, it's the Borges question. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
Yeah, there's a long history to this one, I think. Um, it was uh, the year that I was living in Spain. Um, I traveled, as you would, in in Europe. It was the first time I'd ever been to Europe, so it was a wonderful opportunity. And uh, and in, in I think about January the 3rd, I was in Geneva, and it was freezing cold and snowing, and I, I don't know how, but I accidentally um, came across the cemetery where Borges is buried. Um, and I had just taken, the previous year, I had studied um, a bit of Old English, um, well, for all year, I guess. And so I was really surprised. And for me, it was a new discovery because I had no idea that uh, Borges had 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 this link to Old English. So then I was literally standing in, in the Plain Palais, looking at his grave and, and looking at both sides and discovering his connection to Old English. And later that same day, and I admit it was partly because I was getting warm, I, I went into a bookstore in Geneva and I discovered um, Quirk and Wren, um, they're the basic, sort of one of the basic texts that they use in England um, by Randolph Quirk and uh, C.L. Wren, an introduction to Old English. Um, and I discovered a copy of it sitting on the shelf in this bookstore and I bought it. Um, it's sort of the foundational text of my own library in Old English, which is surrounding me here in my office. And I just, it, so it stuck in my mind. And, uh, and I, so I, the, the link between the two just stuck in my mind for years. Um, and I don't know, do you want me to stop there and or, or keep? Yeah. Então, é, tem uma longa história sobre como a professora Tosso chegou ao Borges e começa nesse terceiro ano que ela passou um, na Espanha e tomou a oportunidade de viajar pelo resto da Europa e se encontrou no muito frio janeiro uh, na Geneva, em, na Suíça, e eh, se deparou com a, o cemitério que tem o Borges, onde ele, o Borges está enterrado. Encontrou que esse no cemitério o Borges tem uma placa que tem eh, anglo-saxão, tem Old English, inglês antigo, e ela não tinha, não sabia até esse momento que o Borges tivesse conhecido, tivesse tido qualquer conexão com, com o anglo-saxão. E isso ficou dentro dela, essa, essa conexão ficou com ela muito tempo. Uh, depois, porque justamente estava muito frio, ela acabou numa, num, uh, comprando um livro, entrou numa livraria e comprou um livro sobre os estudos de uh, uh, língua anglo-saxã. Então, que é como o centro da biblioteca dela, que ainda continua sobre é, estudos anglo-saxões. Então, essa conexão entre a introdução aos estudos anglo-saxões, o encontro com o Borges e essa, é, o cemitério com é, anglo-saxão em Borges, ficou aí como uma, uma continuação para ela durante muito tempo. E agora ela vai contar um pouco mais, vai continuar com isso. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I, I'd always sort of been reading bits of Borges. I gradually over the years um, collected his materials, um, most of what he wrote. And, uh, and I came back to it, I guess, more formally because of two things. Um, my colleague, Kalina Andre Mihaliescu, uh, had discovered uh, some lectures that Borges gave in Harvard. Um, he discovered radio tapes of these lectures and um, sorry tapes and as and he came by and said he there were these weird words and and it was there any chance that I would recognize them and he played them and of course Borges in a beautiful accent had read bits out of this seafarer and the wanderer and maybe a bit of Beowulf and so I was able to write the words down immediately for my colleague he was a little horrified that I had no trouble at it and I was kind of looking at him thinking but these are these are the most classic bits and Borges said them exactly right so there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that that's what's going on here um, and that made me think again and so uh, I was I guess it's 10 years ago now um, about to take a freighter I'd like to take freighters and I had booked one around the world and so I needed work that I could do for four and a half months on the ocean without access to the internet and I decided 
that I'd always had an interest in translation and that I would like to do something by Borges. Um, so I dug around and, and found um, the uh, Antiguas Literaturas Medievales and thought this, this would be a good thing to translate on the freighter. So that's what I did. Uh, and then I realized that I was really interested in Borges and I had lots more thoughts and I really felt that uh, maybe I just needed to point out the obvious of how much his engagement with Old English had affected his writing and thinking over his entire career. Um, because although he said he started with Old English in his 50s, um, he'd actually published on the Kenning in 1921 um, when he was you know, not yet 30. Uh, well, actually 20, 22, 23, something like that. Um, so I really felt there was a lot to be said. Mm -hmm. Um, então, isso também tem, tem um, uma série de, de encontros fortuitos na carreira da, da professora Truslo. E é, essa aqui tem a ver com, com o Borges e como ela, ela entrou realmente no tema até escrever o que foram os primeiros livros sobre isso. Ela sempre tinha lido sobre Borges, é, mas um dia chegou um colega dela e ele tinha encontrado umas gravações de apresentações do Borges em Harvard que tinham umas palavras estranhas e que talvez ele queria saber se ela podia entender o que ele estava dizendo. Resulta que essas palavras estranhas eram realmente uma recitação num, numa, um, de uma maneira quase perfeita de falar dos alguns dos poemas de anglo-saxão mais famosos e ele realmente sabia o que estava fazendo, estava lendo da maneira correta, e ela pôde eh, traduzir, dizer para o seu colega exatamente o que eles eram, e ele ficou muito impressionado, como podia ser uma coisa tão tão conhecida para ela, e tão desconhecida sobre o Borges. Um, então, é, tendo isso como uma base, ela nos conta que gosta de tomar eh, longas viagens em barco, onde ela não tem internet, não tem outras coisas para fazer, e então ele estava buscando um, um tema para poder estudar durante mais de quatro meses, enquanto eu estava nesse barco, e decidiu que, como sempre, gostou muito de fazer traduções, ia, ia fazer uma tradução do, do Borges, do livro dele sobre antigas ah, literaturas medievais, e eh, fazendo essa tradução ficou cada vez mais interessada, porque a quantidade de estudos medievais que o Borges tem é realmente muito importante, e ela começou a descobrir que isso que parecia muito óbvio para ela, não era necessariamente óbvio fora ou dentro dos estudos de neomedievalismo, então ela decidiu que ia escrever um livro acadêmico sobre todas as formas de, de, de usos do, do anglo-saxão que faz o Borges, ah, que ele mesmo, Borges diz que ele começou com 50 anos a estudar, mas que, na verdade, ele começou muito mais cedo, já no começo da, da vida dele, ele tinha escrito sobre os Kennings, que são é, umas formas de metáfora anglo-saxã. Obrigado. E o Borges me uh, levou para que eu, basicamente, finished um projeto no ano passado sobre Longfellow, e fiz alguns artigos sobre ele. Uh, and the last one is on Longfellow and Borges, um, which I'm hoping will come out fairly soon. And, uh, and so that, yeah, I, I, I keep moving on. But when I ba look back at Borges, I mean, there's some wonderful people starting to work on Borges, but there's more to be said, I think, about his engagement with medievalism. Um, and partly I think it's interesting because it's through his last wife, Oh, last wife, his only wife, Maria Kodama, um, whom he married uh, just a few weeks before he died um, in Geneva, that uh, I think there's things that she could tell us too. Um, and I hope somebody manages to have that conversation with her fairly soon. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm going to translate this, but then we should really go into what are your, your projects, your, because yeah. this is going in that direction. Então, eu digo, vou traduzir essa partezinha, mas é já realmente parte da última pergunta sobre quais os projetos uh, mais recentes e os projetos nos quais ela está trabalhando. Um, ela diz que está trabalhando sobre um livro da, de uh, Longfellow 
e Borges, que tem ainda muitas coisas para fazer sobre Borges, que tem cada vez mais estudos sobre o medievalismo de Borges, mas que é, realmente é muito interessante e não está, não tem sido completamente é, estudado, especialmente porque tem a viúva do Borges, a Maria Kodama, que é, poderia ter muito a dizer sobre isso e ela esperar que alguém muito pronto possa ter realmente uma conversa com, com a Maria Kodama sobre isso. E agora ela vai começar a falar um pouco mais dos novos projetos. Aí eu vou traduzir depois. Vem. Ok, so what I'm working on at the moment, um, uh, well, two large projects at the moment um, and, and quite diametrically opposed to each other. Um, one of them is the, the Psalms in the 12th century, mostly in England. Um, I'm struck by the fact that the earliest Anglo-Norman um, glosses and translations of the Psalms were actually done in the 12th century in England. Um, and overlapping with uh, most of the versions of the vernacular psalms that were um, that are called the Anglo-Saxon gloss psalters um, that were done also at that period. So it seems to me that there may have been a, a kind of fertile um, cross-disciplinary engagement, multilinguistic engagement with the Psalter um, in the 12th century in England that because we haven't thought about, and this is back to my let's shift perspectives approach, we haven't really thought about the until Laura Ash and some other people in, in the last 20 years or so, we haven't thought about the multilingualism of the 12th century in England and I, I want to focalize that through the Psalms. Um, so I have a number of projects going on that front. And then I also, uh, my other biggest project at the moment is uh, something I'm calling Medieval Canada. Yeah. Um, I'm going to translate that. Então, ela tem dois projetos muito diferentes um do outro, um, grandes projetos. O primeiro é em estudos medievais e é sobre os salmos um, no século XII, o que ela está descobrindo é que tem certas glossas dos salmos em, em anglo-normando que estão de alguma maneira relacionados com a, com a parte anglo-saxã, eu acho que eu entendi, do, do século XII na Inglaterra. E o que é importante para ela nesse projeto é justamente essas novas perspectivas, porque não temos pensado na disciplina sobre a ideia do do multilingualismo na Inglaterra no século XII. Então, assim como ela estava pensando no que eram nos monastérios as mulheres que podiam estar sendo quem tinham escrito a crônica, esse é parecido no sentido de uma perspectiva nova sobre multilingualismo na Inglaterra no século XII, estudado através dos salmos. Então, esse é um dos projetos dela, é, e o outro é sobre neomedievalismo, o medievalismo canadense, e ela vai nos contar agora. Sim. Yeah, the, so the Medieval Canada project um, started, I thought, as something nice and simple. I was planning to argue that um, medievalism in Canada is greatly inflected by the fact that the, the settlers of Canada were, in large part, United Empire loyalists. Um, and they were middle, upper class um, of English stock or British stock. Um, who did not want to stay in America. So uh, although there had been some settlement of Canada beforehand, um, it was the United Empire Loyalists leaving America in the wake of the American War of Independence um, and taking their wealth and their thinking with them that really built um, Ontario in particular, but also to some extent Quebec and certainly across the provinces in Canada and also in the Maritimes, a significant portion of them settled in the Maritimes too, um, sailed from Boston. So I had this nice easy argument that uh, medievalism in Canada largely came through the British 19th century lens. Now I'm finding, of course, that it's a much more complicated business and that I need to think a lot more about settler colonialism and post-colonialism. And um, so it, as most of my projects do, this one has gotten very complicated and but kind of fun. Então, o segundo projeto é especificamente sobre medievalismo no Canadá, então o medievalismo canadense. Ela começou com uma ideia 
simples na, na mente dela, que era que o, o medievalismo no Canadá tinha começado com os colonos que tinham decidido que não queriam ficar nos Estados Unidos quando os Estados Unidos independizou da, da coroa inglesa, um, e é, que levaram todo o seu dinheiro, uh, o seu pensamento, as suas formas de, de, de imaginar o que era um, para o Canadá, eles é, colonizaram principalmente Ontário, mas também Quebec e outras partes do Canadá, um, e que eram, um, eles continuavam sendo é, loyal, perdão, vou ter que pensar qual é a palavra, é, fiel, fiéis, obrigada, fiéis à coroa britânica. Então, ela pensava no começo que isso era a, a razão pelo medievalismo canadense, mas está descobrindo, como sempre, quando começa a investigar mais aprofundando, que isso não é tão simples, que vai ter que continuar estudando mais sobre eh, pós-colonialismo, sobre os, o pós-colonialismo dos colonos e demais para fazer esse, esse trabalho. Então, eu vou agradecer e vamos abrir a, as perguntas que possa haver tanto aqui na sala quanto no YouTube. Jane, thank you very much. Um, we are now going to open the for questions and um, I'll translate if they are in Portuguese or otherwise. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. So here, I will probably need some help. Eu vou precisar um pouco de ajuda para que alguém, porque eu não estava um, vendo qual, qual, quem estava fazendo perguntas, se alguém pode me ajudar na sala uh, e no YouTube, eu vou agradecer. Tem aqui um que pergunta uh, <risos> se você pode... Se, se ela pode falar um pouco mais sobre a separação entre estudos medievais e medievalismo. E and, and is, and essa é a segunda parte da pergunta, uh, se finalmente não são os estudos medievais derivados do medievalismo que começa no historicismo do século XIX. Yeah, that, that is the overlapping point, isn't it? Um, and um, I had some notes about historiography in the 19th century because I do do some work in that area. Um, it, I agree that the way in which we do medieval studies is wholly inflected by the interests that people who first started engaging in it in the 19th century what they pursued and what they were interested in and how they pursued the work. Um, so yes, from that point of view, medieval studies and medievalism really are um, imbricated. They're really closely connected. Uh, and and they, but I do think that, that there was a difference in, I guess the person I think about is Anna Gurney, um, who I did a bit of work on recently. And she thought of medieval studies and her work in medieval studies as scholarship, as professional work. And she thought of the ways in which um, people were running medieval fairs in her local village as unprofessional work. So that's sort of the distinction that I was trying to make between the amateur and the professional, um, which is certainly something that people have made with respect to 19th century medieval studies and medievalism. And, and for me, I think it's, it still holds, but I recognize that it's, uh, I'm probably wrong. Um. Um, então, ela está de acordo que sim, claro que eh, o medievalismo do século XIX eh, está embrincado, está junto e é a base do, do que são depois os estudos medievais. Um, então, nesse sentido, sendo o que continua, o que vem depois e se, basa, se baseia nos, uh, no medievalismo do século XIX, sim. Mas, ao mesmo tempo, ela acha que há uma diferença eh, com respeito a, a, uma, a uma forma profissional de fazer estudos medievais, frente a uma forma que não é profissional. 
um, que provavelmente ela não está, não é o correto, que talvez ela, ela realmente não está errada, mas que ela continua pensando, ela, ela acha que esse, essa diferença se mantém, e pensa como exemplo a, em, na Ana Gurney, um, que justamente considerava que ela estava fazendo um estudo profissional da Idade Média, e as feiras medievais estavam fazendo uma forma que não era profissional, e ela acha que essa diferença se mantém, mesmo que não todo mundo ache como ela. There seem to be lots of questions developing there. <laughs> Which one do you want me to have a shot at? Oh, because you can see them. Okay, I am. Um, I'm just going from. I believe I'm going from the first uh, to what comes next. So this is um, the next one. Ela, um, eu vou traduzir ao português. Um, a pergunta é se ela pode falar um pouco mais sobre a ideia um, comum de que, que existe de que o neomedievalismo na teoria não estaria conectado com a Idade Média verdadeira, real. Um, ok, so neomedievalism and medievalism and the Middle Ages, yeah. Um, it, yeah, this, this, was, this is an interesting issue. Um, I changed my mind on this one. I know academics aren't supposed to do this, but I did. Um, and I came to the conclusion that neomedievalism is a term that really works for talking about a Middle Ages that never was. Um, and uh, obviously the the best way to configure that is is by way of uh, Baudrillard's simulacrum. Um, that when we're talking about neo-medievalism, in my view, there's a kind of uh, disconnect uh, and, and it's a kind of fundamental disconnect. Um, and so people who engage in neo-medievalism are engaging in uh, a recreation of an, of, of an originary story that never existed. Um, and and they have more freedom as a result, uh, but they also have the appearance of verisimilitude, the appearance of authenticity. And when we talk about um, the Middle Ages, we have a deep desire for authenticity uh, that that is quite fascinating. You know, people who are developing video games hire medieval historians. Um, the Beowulf movies hire medieval literature specialists um, who, you know, report back afterwards that everything they said was completely ignored. Um, but the, uh, the desire for the appearance of authenticity is, is kind of embedded. So for me, that's what neo-medievalism means. Um, but I recognize that there's another entire uh, collection in the field for which neo-medievalism is very contemporary medievalism digital media in medievalism. And uh, I think eventually we're going to sort out slightly different terms for those two elements, but for now I think that's where we sit. Um, a resposta, então, é que ela, ela estava dizendo que mudou um pouco uh, o que ela pensa sobre isso. Um, I have to say, Jane, I'm not yet really sure how you change your mind. Um, I might pick your brain a little more, uh, but ah, ela está dizendo, eu não reconheço onde está a diferença do que ela uh, escreveu sobre simulacro no passado, mas podemos falar disso depois. Ela diz que eh, ela pensa no neomedievalismo como a unidade média que nunca existiu e que se basa, então, na ideia do Baudrillard do simulacro, uh, que tem, então, um, uma desconexão fundamental no neomedievalismo frente ao medievalismo, onde tem uma recriação de um origem que, na verdade, não existe, um, um origem que não existe, que não está. Então, por isso, o simulacro. Você recria uma coisa que, na verdade, nunca existiu. Ah, isso dá muito mais liberdade a quem faz neomedievalismo, mas, ao mesmo tempo, quem faz neomedievalismo como simulacro está buscando, tem um desejo de verossimilitude, de que tenha a aparência de autenticidade, ah, e quem faz o medievalismo é talvez o mais importante, é querer essa verossimilitude que não está no simulacro, que se encontra então nos filmes, 
e constantemente tendo pessoas que têm estudos medievais de base para explicar, para dizer, para ter como consulta e ao mesmo tempo não é o, no fim não é usado essas essas ideias de base da, dos estudos medievais mas que justamente o neomedievalismo está marcado por esse desejo de verossimilitude num simulacro ah, e que tem esse outro grupo que está pensando diferente é, que considera que o neomedievalismo é principalmente só para um medievalismo muito contemporâneo especialmente para estudos ah, de mídia digital e que, é, nesse sentido, há uma diferença. Ela não considera que seja somente para a mídia digital, senão que tem um neomedievalismo que está em outras formas. Ah, e que, eventualmente, ela imagina que vai ter um, um, um nome diferente para essas duas formas. Um, the next one... Um, do you want me to translate? It might be that you can, you find it. Uh, is, that, is that Helber Lessa's question? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm confused by the fact that there's a chat with a bunch of questions on one side of my screen and then these questions emerging. So uh, the, I'll just focus on the ones that are appearing on the bottom of the screen. The yeah. questions that emerge are the ones that I'm picking from the chat as oh, questions. Okay. So that's why I put them on the screen for you and for uh, the rest of those that are watching. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, from Helber Lessa is a question about uh, what do you think are the main differences and similarities um, that you see between how English literature treats the Middle Ages and how Latin, um, by which we would say Romance languages, um, mm -hmm. you also studied later on. Wow. Um, hmm. Well, there's there's the easy answer, um, which is that English literature sort of constructs for itself a nice uh, narrative about the hegemony of English, um, and so it sees the Middle Ages as a period in which the language of English heroically survived the Anglo-Norman period and came back strong in the 14th and 15th centuries. Um, so that when we're talking about the, uh, the the hegemonic narrative of English engagement with the Middle Ages, it's, it's a kind of twofold thing, which is why we teach Old English at one end of the subject and Middle English at the other end of the subject. And we've kind of largely ignored the 11th to the 13th centuries in the middle of the subject. Um, and uh, so that particular narrative uh, kind of avoids what I think is uh, is in some ways the most interesting kinds of issues about, um, you know, post, well, actually th that you've worked on, Nadia, on post-coloniality in the Middle Ages. Um, Uh, so if you took that narrative and then you looked at what's going on in Spain, then you have very different approach because we all talk about the convivencia and the ways in which in Spain there was already cooperation amongst the nations. Um, and, and so that I would complicate, obviously, because uh, the convivencia argument people have really been looking at recently, haven't they, and thinking about Uh, whether or not that was a political fiction, a polite fiction, um, and uh, to what extent it was actually an embedded uh, multilingual and, and multicultural engagement. Um, so I guess the, the easy answer is that English is all about, uh, English medievalism is all about uh, the English language and Spanish medievalism is all about a much more complex interest, intersectionality of different kinds of languages and cultures. But I think the more complicated answer is, is that we need to think more about both approaches. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I should stop there. <laughs> um, então, a resposta é, é complicada, mas a forma de falar disso de um jeito talvez mais, mais é, simples, que, que tenha uma forma mais clara, é dizer que na, nos estudos 
eh, de inglês, o que encontramos é uma hegemonia do inglês como uma língua, que a, a Idade Média está construída como uma história heróica da supervivência da língua inglesa frente ao que foi o, a, a conquista anglo-normanda. E que isso leva, então, a que os estudos de língua inglesa têm, de um lado, falando da língua anglo-saxã, fazem saltam por em cima do período anglo-normando e, do outro lado, falam do é, inglês médio, do middle English. Um, então, o que seria mais interessante do que fazer isso, onde se fala da língua como essa narrativa heróica de, de, de ter mantido a identidade, seria realmente falar do, é, do aspecto da colonização e, do, e dos estudos pós-coloniais dentro da Idade Média mesmo, um, isso seria um pouco a história do inglês, que não fala do que é a, o colonialismo e os estudos pós-coloniais e faz, simplesmente, deixa, deixa aberta todo esse momento de anglo-normando. Nos estudos é, da Espanha, o que seria, a, a, o que tem sido a ideia principal é a de convivência, era é de um mundo multicultural e multilinguístico dentro da Espanha medieval, ah, que tem agora começado a ser eh, criticado como talvez uma uma ideia mais eh, política e, e, não dizer, ideológica, de querer encontrar isso na Idade Média do que realmente o que talvez tenha acontecido. Então, se ela vai dividir essas duas eh, formas de entender, te, temos em inglês a língua ah, e na Espanha, uma visão mais complexa sobre multiculturalismo e multilinguismo, mas que provavelmente a realidade é que as duas narrativas têm que ser reconsideradas e voltas a criticar e a, e a ser vistas de maneira diferente. Um, I'm looking for the next question. Um, tem as perguntas no, no chat privado também. Ah, sim, claro, obrigada. Eu estava esperando, pensei que não tinha. Vamos então, fazer. Então... Desculpa, ah. pode Vamos fazer as do chat. We will do the YouTube uh, chat first and then the last one from, from here, from the broadcast. Ok. Uh. It has to be brought in. Um, <laughs> as long as there's nothing I have to do, Nadia. <laughs> You have to answer. <laughs> answering is fine. <laughs> so these are from the chat. Yeah. Um, Luis? This one about methodological challenges. Oh. Oh. Você vai trazer as perguntas do chat? Não tem como trazer as perguntas do chat aqui de dentro, não. As pessoas teriam que falar, porque elas estão aqui dentro, elas podem falar. Ou então você lê as perguntas que escreveram aqui no chat privado. Eu, eu posso... Está tá no lado ali, tem uma aba de private chat. Eu posso ler para você também, se você quiser. E tem uma última do YouTube, que é da Carolina Gual. Ah, estou vendo aqui. Uhum. Yes. Ok, então... This is me, Jane. That it's the first time I use this. So, the private chat is also here. So, we We will do the last one that I have here, and then I will move to the chat. Perdão, todo mundo que estava fazendo as perguntas no, no chat privado, eu não, não percebi. Vou, vamos fazer a última dessas aqui, e depois passo a todas as que tem no, no chat. Então, a última, é se a professora Toswell pode falar um pouco mais sobre os desafios metodológicos uh, para os historiadores usando... Um, Bom, sources, um, arquivos literários. Yeah, that's a... The, 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 we run so much into these issues of disciplinary approach, don't we? That uh, we need to break those down a bit more. Uh, yes, literature scholars tend to find the way that historians use literary sources um, pretty simplistic. Um, and kind of painful because when you're using a literary source you you're the first thing is that it 
it's probably got material in it that is in that came from someone's mind that didn't actually come from um actions things that happened so i guess if i need to need to use an example um historians like to use the old english poem the battle of malden and they they think of it as demonstrating exactly what happened in the battle whereas literary scholars point out that that battle is a highly structured literary text and that the likelihood that different warriors would stop to deliver you know, little speeches before going off to die gloriously in battle is not high. Um, so I think there are, the, the, the historians using literary sources need to be aware of the fact that they are literary. But on the other hand, in the Middle Ages, they did not draw these distinctions that we draw today. And so I think literary people also need to recognize that the histories of the Middle Ages, the materials written by the historians in the Middle Ages, also have highly literary approaches or what we would call literary approaches in them. So I, I think we need to have a little bit more in the way of um, detailed discussion of historiography um, and of literary approaches. I'm, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, então, essa é uma pergunta difícil, sempre tem questões sobre como se aproximar dessas diferentes disciplinas ao material da Idade Média. Ela encontra que, eh, para muitos, para muitos eh, professores de literatura ou, ou aqueles que estudam a parte literária, encontram que a perspectiva histórica pode ser... Eh, simples demais, que pode estar muito baseada na ideia de que algumas coisas aconteceram, nos fatos que aconteceram, eh, mas que os textos são textos que estão mostrando o que certas pessoas pensaram e como pensaram e como construíram essas ideias. Ah, e que, então, devem ser estudadas não só como, como, como dados. Ao mesmo tempo, a Idade Média não, não pensava dessa maneira, ah, então, os textos que são supostamente históricos também deveriam ser lidos pelos estu estudosos de literatura, considerando que aí também tem toda uma série de formas de trabalhar um, que são eh, narrativas e literárias, mas que realmente todos deveríamos pensar um pouco mais nessa questão e na historiografia de outra maneira. Um, e agora eu vou ir para o private chat. Uh, e ver quais um, são as perguntas. I'm going to go to the private chat. I think, uh, Jane, can you see the private chat now? Is it, yeah, so that's what I'm going to be looking for, um, for the question. Um, there's a question here that I don't know how to bring to the, um, to you. Eu, I'm não going to just colocar o private chat em destaque, não. Não se pode. Ok. So, I'm going to read it. Um, Luiz, aqueles que estão no, no canal de YouTube podem ler esse não. private chat agora? Não. Então, eu vou ler não. em português e traduzir. Então, tem uma pergunta... As pessoas do private chat estão, estão aqui, então você pode pedir que a pessoa fale também, caso queira. Eu vou, vamos fazer isso. Ah, tem uma pergunta da Maria Eugênia Bertarelli. Maria Eugênia, quer, quer fazer a tua pergunta? Sim, yes, a uh, segunda, porque a primeira, você já respondeu. Mas a segunda é se você falar mais sobre o seu estudo de Borges e Medievalismo. Yeah. Um, well, I I felt pretty strongly that there's a real problem in Borges' scholarship um, that I felt a lot of what he did in, in right through his life and a lot of the tropes and ideas that he was playing with um, were things that came out of Old English and Old Norse. Um, and there's there's so much scholarship on Borges that it and, and fascinating, interesting, wonderful stuff. Um, 
and 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 so sophisticated too that I I felt I have to admit when I was starting to work on Borges I felt like I was you know looking at this wonderful mass of brilliant work and sort of trying to bring in a really simple tiny well except not tiny fact um, to bear in it that uh, th that really should should have been balanced out by the other um, by all of the criticism of Borges and I and and I did look to see whether anybody had commented on his fascination with Germanic medievalism his whole life I mean he it's what he taught when he was teaching at the Universidad de Buenos Aires it's what he clearly brought in to all of his writing um, and I did find a few references uh, but they were always um, annoyed um, they felt that it was uh, it was something that took away from what should have been his engagement with Latin America with Hispano America, and I I felt that uh, I don't think Borges saw that dichotomy. I don't think he saw himself as uh, you know following an, a, a, a a Germanic medieval tradition rather than uh, responding to uh, the world in which he had grown up in Buenos Aires. Uh, I think he felt that they were connected, um, but I. I, I do feel that exactly how they were connected, we have yet to really work out. Um, I, I think it, it was, in some ways, in his mind, I think it was simpler than it actually was. So that when he was writing about those uh, those knife fights with the cuchillos um, in uh, in the barrios in Buenos Aires, I think he saw a link to vengeance fights in Old English and Old Norse. And I, I don't know if there really is one, but I, I think it's quite fascinating to think about and then to think about the problems with Borges scholarship. I shouldn't say problems, but the interesting way in which Borges scholarship could uh, take more account of Borges concerns um, on, on and, and his engagement with this material. So does that help a bit? Yes, yes. Um, eu, eu vou traduzir. Um, então, o que ela está dizendo sobre o medievalismo em Borges é que realmente muito do que o Borges fez vem da, do anglo-saxão, do inglês antigo e do Old Norse. A mentor não sei como traduzir ao, a, ao português, alguém vai ter que, que dizer. E que tem realmente muitíssimo no Borges sobre, sobre esse, esse tema. Um, em que, então, vendo toda a quantidade de estudos que tinha sobre Borges, estudos brilhantes, ela encontrava que ela queria introduzir essa, esse conhecimento, talvez simples, mas muito importante, que não, que não estava, um fato realmente, bom, não central, mas que está constante no Borges. Ah, e que ela encontrou que dentro das poucas pessoas que tinham falado um pouco disso, achavam que era negativo, que tirava de Borges em vez de dar mais ao Borges, que ele consideravam que de alguma maneira o Borges deveria ter eh, se focado mais na América Latina e não nesses temas das literaturas germânicas. Um, e que ela acha que o Borges não não via isso dessa maneira, que ele não considerava que isso, era, isso tirava da América Latina, ah, que provavelmente ele considerava que estavam conectados, uh, ao mesmo tempo que provavelmente ele considerava que estavam conectados de uma maneira mais simples do que realmente eh, eles estão conectados, que, por exemplo, quando ele pensava nos, uh, nos, eh, nos compadritos que estão eh, se, se batalhando com uma faca, que ele encontrava que, de alguma maneira, estava eh, conectado com as batalhas por vingança nas literaturas germânicas, e que provavelmente não era exatamente dessa maneira, ah, mas que nós deveríamos pensar muito mais, ah, fazer muito mais trabalho sobre isso, e, e que talvez os estudos sobre Borges eh, poderiam ter mais em conta essa parte do trabalho dele que está tão presente por tanto tempo, quase a vida inteira do Borges, tem alguma coisa é, relacionada com o tema. Ok, thanks. 
Thank you. Um, tem uma pergunta do João Batista. João Batista, você está no canal? Eu não sei se posso te encontrar. Se alguém pode trazer o João Batista um, para aqui. Obrigado. So, thank you very much. And uh, in the beginning of the interview, uh, you talked about the love of the enthusiastic in medieval events. So, in, in your opinion, I would like to know uh, why do the Middle Ages continue to fascinate people in the 21st century? What inspires or promotes this interest in, for the Middle Ages? Yeah, that, that's a fascinating question, isn't it? Um, yes. I'm reminded of the, I read somewhere recently, and I can't remember who said it, uh, that uh, there are as many paths to God as there are individuals in the world. Um, and so I, I want to, I want to try to figure it out. I, it's, um, you know, I, you could fall back on Umberto Eco's taxonomies of the interests in the medieval. Um, at the, I was at the medievalism conference over the weekend and there was a good amount of criticism of Eco's taxonomies. Um, and they are about 40, 40, 50 years old now. Anyway, I, I do think that there are, there are different strains of engagement with the medieval uh, that that we should be teasing out and thinking about because, you know, I, I had a a military student, uh, sorry, a, a, somebody who was actually in the Canadian military in my course a few years ago in medieval studies, and over the course of the year, he bought uh, from a reenactor all of the pieces of a medieval 14th century suit of arms, um, and he turned up fully dressed in class at one point um, and the, his fellow students were fascinated and he delighted in clanking around the campus uh, and bringing his medieval knight to the campus. So, I, and, and in his mind, it was clearly a connection of the warrior ethos, the medieval warrior, the modern warrior. He was the modern warrior wearing this medieval outfit. Um, he did admit that uh, his medieval outfit worked very poorly in the rain. Um, but so I think there's, there's that line of engagement, which could be quite dangerous, to be honest, um, and is quite dangerous, I think, in, in quite a lot of people's minds. Um, they, they just draw this direct line of the Middle Ages to the modern period and um, think that they should try to recreate their version of the Middle Ages. So I, I think there are some very dangerous lines of, of, of engagement with the Middle Ages, but I think in general, I think people imagine that it's a period when if you were rich enough, you could do whatever you felt like doing. And so there's a kind of freedom to your to the engagement with the Middle Ages of, okay, I can dress as I feel like dressing and order people around and I can spend my days playing music and uh, reading poetry and uh, just uh, feeling unmoored from the present. Um, and certainly during the pandemic, we want to feel unmoored from the present. So there's, there's an engagement there, but I do, I think uh, that there's a lot of quite naive engagement with the medieval because none of those people in the middle ages could spend their days reading poetry and listening to music. Um, it just wasn't happening. So uh, I, I think there's a lot of, yeah, naive uh, sort of, I and but also dangerously naive and ideological engagement with the Middle Ages that that as professionals in the field we have to think about. Um, and then I think there's also a, a, just a deep seated sense of the fun of of the Middle Ages that people want to play with, have jousts and tournaments and dress up events. I, I don't know if that really answers what you're looking for, but that's my best 
shot at it. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that Nadja, you will translate. Do you want to translate yourself as a cat? Uh, no, I don't know if I could uh, take the because I uh, I would like to make a one last question. I don't know if we can do and uh, after we can translate everything because there's something uh, there is a connection between this last question and the the, the previous one. Uh, in your opinion, politically, is there any relationship between all these medieval events, re reenactment, living history, and uh, and uh, medieval affairs, and uh, nationalist movements uh, like uh, alt right and far right movements? Eu vou ter que fazer primeiro a tradução. I, I will translate uh, first right. what happened before and translate this question so you can think. <laughs> Um, então, o, o João uh, perguntou sobre a fascinação que tem no século XIX uh, pelo, pela Idade Média, que a professora Tosso falou disso no começo. Uh, então, a resposta dela é que tem muitas diferentes, vamos dizer, caminhos pelos quais isso aparece, que talvez até eh, nós acabamos voltando para Humberto Eco e essas as dez pequenas idades médias que é um texto bem antigo e ao mesmo tempo continua sendo muito, muito usado, que ela esteve no congresso agora da, da ISSM e teve muita discussão sobre Eco e essas diferentes taxonomias e ainda temos que fazer muita crítica, mas assim mesmo... Ah, falando desses diferentes caminhos, ela contou a história de um estudante de, de escola que, que é militar, e ele comprou toda uma série de objetos ah, militares, como armadura, etc., e levou para aula, e ele então fazia essa conexão com o ethos militar da Idade Média, um, que ela considera também que esse, esse tipo de, de conexão pode ser muito perigoso, que às vezes realmente é por fazer uma recriação das nossas próprias ou das versões do que é a Idade Média de cada um, que às vezes são muito problemáticas. Uh, ela acha que eh, tem também uma ideia das pessoas de que na Idade Média, se um, uma pessoa tem o suficiente dinheiro, podia simplesmente fazer o que quiser, tinha essa liberdade para estar ouvindo música e lendo e, e se divertindo o tempo inteiro, ah, que isso realmente não não foi nunca realidade medieval, e que talvez hoje na pandemia temos essa essa, essa ideia de, de nos desconectar do mundo, mas que isso não, não era uma possibilidade. Ah, e que também tem outro caminho, que é essa sensação muito forte de... de de, de fã, de, de diversão da Idade Média, ah, como se, se vestir, fazer eh, justas eh, esses encontros. Um, e, um, então, passamos por essas diferentes formas, mas que é o máximo que ela pode eh, dizer assim, sem, sem eh, pensar nisso mais profundamente. E eh, o João Batista fez uma segunda pergunta, que a professora agora vai responder, e é sobre a conexão com todas essas formas e, e o nacionalismo. Yeah, um, I, there, there's a number of different answers to that question. One is that, uh, and, and something on which Nadia has written a lot, the connection of nation with medieval studies and medievalism, um, and the way in which so much of the Uh, first couple of generations of studies in medievalism focused by nation. Um, and so we really need to break that link because uh, you can get too caught up in that. Um, and and so on, on, from the academic side, we need to pay more attention to those issues. Um, but that's, uh, that's a pretty minor problem by comparison to the way in which um, the alt-right has taken up uh, a lot of its ideology for white supremacy from medieval materials. Um, and of course, that's always been a thread running through um, some kinds of thinking. I mean, you can look at the Nazis, you can look at Wagner and the way in which he um, instantiated that kind of thinking. Um, but it's, it's really, uh, and it's certainly been toxic before, but it does seem to be an extremely toxic line 
uh, of connection, which allows quite a number of sort of young white men to murder people indiscriminately in several different countries around the world. Um, you know, New Zealand, America, Canada, uh, Denmark. I mean, it, it's, it's very striking the extent to which they've used um, notably Old Norse materials, but uh, I guess you would call it Germanic medievalism, notions of Odin and Thor. Um, and, uh, you know, and they're fed by a range of different kinds of uh, engagement. So, you know, heavy metal music. I've, I've had students presenting on what is actually in the text of these heavy metal songs and it's terrifying stuff. So uh, I think we have to engage with it. We have to think about it and we have to, uh, maybe this is one of those cases where we have no choice but to be public medievalists and, and come out and talk about it and make it clear that there's two lines of response, right? One is, and quite a lot of scholars are pursuing this, um, to point out that the, this ethos is wrong, um, that the Middle Ages were not a period of white supremacy, that they were much more multicultural and much more global and engaged. Um, and that's, uh, that's one line of thinking, but I, I do think that we also have to, you know, not be too defensive and, and admit that there are problems and uh, in, in certainly, you know, the way in which we conceive of the Battle of Tour, you know, Charles Martel beating back the Islamic um, invasion, that that's a 19th century, or actually it's an 18th century construction, isn't it? Going back to Edward Gibbon, um, that we haven't yet really refuted enough um, and said that this is not what happened, but in some part it was, and it's not right. And we actually are gonna to have to be less defensive about the Middle Ages and and start saying that, yeah, there were there were behaviors that are unacceptable and, and we can't just try to explain them by giving a, a broader sense of their context because people don't listen to messages that are that complicated. We actually are gonna to have to just admit that many things that happened in the Middle Ages are not acceptable. You know, the, the first crusade in Jerusalem is completely not acceptable. And we're just going to have to say this. Um, and we're going to have to look at the several different versions of the, the slaughter there and, and talk about it and not try to gloss it over. Um, because we often do gloss it over and we talk about it only, you know, in conferences that are far away from the uh, the everyday world of people trying to figure this stuff out. So, yeah, I think we have to take that two-pronged approach. What do you think? Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I would like to thank you and congratulations. Thank you for your answer. Uh, um it, it seems Nadia has dropped from from the call so oh, okay yeah, she just disappeared. Uh, I, I would assume the connection must have had some, some problems. So uh, I will briefly uh, assume a moderation here. And then when she's back, I, I will give it back to her. Um, okay. Thanks, I, Luis. I believe, oh, I believe Clean you has a, a question here in the chat, which I will read because I, I don't think he wants to, to speak in English. Right, Clean you? Yes, yeah, all right. But I have a, a next question. After. Okay. Um, so Clini's question is, I would like to return to the discussion about the relationship between medieval and medieval studies. Because the theoretical basis of medievalists was built in the 19th century, 
That is, according to this premise, medieval studies are at the limit medievalism. For example, all lacked in punctuation and transcription used in the construction of sources was done on the theoretical basis of the 19th century. Yeah, that's Cleanius' question, although I would like to just add a bit. Even if it wasn't from the 19th century, um, since reaching the past is impossible, every attempt to do it would fall under the category category of medievalism, after all. So, yeah, that. yes, um, yeah. The most one of the most interesting things on that is is John Dagenet's book, The Ethics of Reading. That you've you've probably read that already, um, and and you're right. There's a there is a continuity, certainly, um, and I, I I know that I'm not um, making an argument that you know it might be something I change my mind on, um, but I I, <laughs> I I guess part of what I worry about, and I'll admit this up front, is getting jobs, um, because medievalism is a hard thing to sell to uh, a hiring committee, given the way in which in in all language and literature departments, we're still stuck with a chronological approach. Um, and it's breaking, uh, and I think in another 10 or 15 years it will be broken, and then I will be able to say, okay, fine, we can, we can, we can acknowledge that it is the same thing. Um, but until that's broken, uh, it's very hard, I think, to do a thesis in medievalism um, and and get a job in medieval studies because the people on the medieval studies side in the department um, don't think that you've done enough medievalism. And if you've done something on 20th century contemporary, if you, for example, a thesis on Tolkien, the people in 20th century English in most departments don't want to hire somebody who works on Tolkien because they think anybody can read Tolkien and talk about Tolkien. And you don't know how to explain to them that, well, that's not really the case. Um, so I, I guess I'm making a very pragmatic argument about the distinction because I, I do think it is collapsing um, and it will be collapsed fairly, fairly soon. Um, but for the purposes of... Uh, thinking about the future of the field uh, I think we have to we have to keep people working uh, as if they're different for for some time to come uh, I know that took a different angle which is not an intellectual one on your question um, but I think it's possibly a true one yes yes I, I agree uh, Luis uh, you uh, could you okay, Nadia, Nadia is back, so. because Nadia is out. Oh, sure. uh, it's no I did not hear the whole question, um, so someone else should translate. Yeah, um, I will do that. So, uh, a resposta da pergunta para a professora foi sobre do professor Clínio foi retomando a discussão sobre a relação entre estudos medievais e medievalismo, se os estudos medievais não seriam, então, um tipo de medievalismo ou parte do medievalismo, uma vez que eles se baseiam principalmente em noções teóricas criadas no século XIX. Ele cita um exemplo específico da pontuação, da, da pontuação e transcrição do latim, que é usado em quase todas as fontes históricas e que tem bases teóricas do século XIX. É, e, e com isso... A professora Jane responde que ela concorda que sim, que no, no, no limite é a mesma coisa, só que ela acha essa, não por razões teóricas aí, mas por razões extremamente pragmáticas, práticas, ela prefere não fazer essa aproximação agora, porque ela entende que existe uma dificuldade de mercado para quem estuda medievalismo, uma vez que quem estuda medievalismo fica órfão, ele não vai ser contratado para dar aula sobre o século XX, mesmo que ele estude Tolkien, porque isso é considerado uma coisa que todo mundo lê. E ele não vai ser contratado para falar de Idade Média, porque ele fala de medievalismo. E, então, para isso, ela defende essa separação de uma maneira pragmática para dar, dar visibilidade para essa área mesmo. E que no futuro pode-se, então, fazer essa aproximação. Daqui a uns 10 anos, ela diz, quando talvez essas barreiras estiverem mais diluídas. É isso. I, I have a, a next question. So, just uh, add 
uh, for you, uh, Middle Ages are a concept. Uh, if you agree. So I, uh, based in, uh, on what said about new medievalism, could you this def could this definition be associated with post-colonial studies? If so, how? I, I, I don't know if you understand, but my English is so. so bizarre. No, no, that's that's really interesting. Um, yes, and, and this is something that I feel very awkward talking about, neo-medievalism, medievalism, medieval studies, and post-colonialism in front of Nadia, because I haven't finished reading her books. <laughs> I've read parts of both, but it's been a busy term, so I apologize. Um, Yes, I think there's a tremendous value to using post-colonial approaches to the Middle Ages. Um, and the difficulty is that, um, well, the, the, the post-colonials themselves tend not to be interested in the Middle Ages um, and argue that the whole point to post-colonialism is that it refers to colonization from the 17th and 18th centuries on. And, and, that sort of, and it ties specifically to um, issues to do with slavery, right? Um, and lots of issues to do with slavery and race. Uh, and so the post-colonialists who study that as a field uh, seem to look upon the Middle Ages as something that happened before they needed to get engaged. Um, uh, but obviously there are um, people in medieval studies who have started to really recognize that we need to engage with these issues and that there is actually all kinds of ways in which the Middle Ages would respond very well to a post-colonial approach. Um, so even uh, what I was talking about earlier, my thinking about the 12th century, I, I think would benefit from some serious post-colonial um, uh, ideas about how they were handling uh, an, in, an, an invading, conquering force um, and uh, writing back against it, if you like to pick a term that post-colonialists use, writing back against the empire. So, I, yes, I think there's, there's a lot of value um, and that we should be rethinking our field in those terms, but I think we also do have to talk to the post-colonialists and get them to understand that, uh, that it's relevant. Um, and that there's lots to be done together. Uh, there's, there's started to be conference sessions and, and, uh, and not just uh, Nadia's work and Kathleen Davis's work and Michelle Warren's work. I think people are starting to really uh, think through these ideas. Uh, but medievalists, as you've probably noticed, weren't, don't do enough engagement with other ways of thinking. Um, they, they get stuck in there. I'm looking at the taxonomy of this manuscript and this text, and I'm going to, um, you know, I'm looking at the stemma, and that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Nadia. Um, someone else will have to do the translation into Portuguese. Clean, you was a traduzir a resposta. No, no. no. <laughs> I, I can't because my English is. I, I understand, but do the translation is so complicated for me. Luis, you can? Oh, yeah, but the problem is I wasn't planning on doing so, so I, I kind of missed a, a little bit of the, of the beginning, but hey, let, let, let's try it. Uh, but. Bom, o que a professora, se alguém puder me ajudar, inclusive, mas o que a professora... O que eu perguntei, na verdade, é, vamos começar da pergunta, porque a resposta dela foi bem elaborada é, também. Eu perguntei se a gente pode associar a definição que ela falou de neomedievalismo a, a, aos estudos pós-coloniais. E se, caso sim, como? A, a discussão começou a partir disso. E aí ela... ela, ela falou que ela... Inclusive, fazendo uma brincadeira que seria legal. É, a Nádia está aqui porque ela citou o livro da Nádia. Enfim, eu acho que era melhor você traduzir. Porque ela não... falou que ela, que ela se sente até envergonhada de falar disso na frente da Nádia, porque ela não terminou de ler nenhum dos dois livros. E ela seguiu falando que... Ela, ela vê que isso está ganhando mais... 
isso está ganhando mais atenção para além do, 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 do tratado pela Nádia e pela... Catherine Davis. Catherine Davis e mais um, que eu não lembro o nome agora. Michelle Warren. Michelle Warren, muito obrigado. Nádia. E que isso está ganhando atenção para além desses, e que ela acha que sim, que por um lado, os pós-colonialistas em geral, geralmente focam na colonização do... no chamado segunda colonização, ali no... 17, 18, 19. E, e questões muito ligadas principalmente à escravidão é e questões raciais. E que eles muitas vezes veem então, o medieval, o passado medieval, como algo muito anterior e que é muito descolado do, 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 do tempo em que eles gostaram de entrar lá e se afirmar como pós-coloniais. Por outro lado, ela também aponta que a. Existem várias formas com qual os estudos medievais podem responder muito bem a uma aproximação pós-colonial e a, a, a métodos pós-coloniais de, de interpretação. Só que um outro problema aí é que os historiadores medievais é, tradicionais, e, e aí eu, eu infelizmente tenho que concordar, esse comentário é meu, é, eles geralmente são um pouco lentos para para ter esse diálogo com, com, outros, com outras áreas, com outros campos. Eles geralmente estão muito preocupados com a taxonomia da fonte e com mostrar ali a especificidade daquela única fonte e, e então, de acordo com ela, um campo muito fechado. E que isso seria um, um, um empecilho dessa aproximação, mas que, como ela falou, ela vê cada vez mais discussões nesse caminho, então é algo que está acontecendo. Eu esqueci alguma coisa. No, it's 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 it's, it's okay. Uh, Nadia, you you. I please. did not hear the answer, um, so I will look at the channel in the YouTube to see what I miss. <laughs> Actually, um, I don't even have in the private chat. I don't have access to it anymore because I was disconnected. So we would have. Uh, we have another nine minutes if someone has a, a short question. Um, otherwise, it's it's a, a very good time to um, to thank you. Does anyone have another short question? I, I just I, I add um, a little more question about the the medievalist, the historian medievalism, uh, about the, uh, I will make in Portuguese, could you translate, Nadia? Sim, claro. Uh, não, então, a, a, é a minha crítica em relação, é por isso que eu, eu voltei à história do século XIX, porque os, o, o, história, o medievalista clássico, digamos assim, ele parece que ele vive num mundo completamente à, à parte, ele reinventou uma Idade Média a partir desses manuscritos e ele foge de questões contemporâneas. Então, assim, um, um, um dilema que a gente vive hoje, o próprio Richard Wood já colocou isso em algumas ocasiões, é que o, o estatuto do, 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 dos medievalistas ele se baseia todo no historicismo no século XIX e no cientificismo. Mas ele não dialoga mais com o, o mundo contemporâneo. E aí, é, é essa disputa de campo entre o medievalismo, né, o medievalismo e os estudos medievais acaba impedindo com, com que campos como essa associação entre neomedievalismo e pós-colonialismo é, é, se desenvolva. E isso aqui no Brasil é muito claro, ou seja, os medievalistas tradicionais eles não pensam nenhum tipo de aproximação, colocam os estudos de medievalismo e neomedievalismo fora do campo e muitas vezes é dizendo que nós não temos nenhum tipo de estatuto de credibilidade científica. So, Nadia, I, I apologize. I, I, I speak a lot, a lot, but it's okay. Sorry. The, the question is returning to the 19th century and this invention and creation of the Middle Ages that also one of its core aspects is to have separated medieval studies from any sort of contemporary issues. Mm. We still have this dilemma and continue to live through it where the ability to have a, a dialogue with contemporary issues has somehow been extracted uh, through this historicism from the 19th century and that it creates situations such as in Brazil where even 
um, the notion that one would have sufficient standing academically to do such work, that that work would not be even recognized as having uh, the academic standing that it needs. So how do we return to, to that in terms of the separation between medieval studies and medievalism or neo-medievalism in a way that is productive and that does not leave us in that dilemma? It's a fascinating issue, isn't it? I, I, I think there's two things that we have to do. Um, first, I think those of us who work in the field have to find ways to make it less frightening um, because we make it very hard for people to do medieval studies. Um, you know, it is hard and you have to have Latin and you have to have some knowledge of paleography and you have to have a variety of skills and, 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 and pieces of knowledge. But we also get very snooty. We get very proud of ourselves um, and, and we should stop with that um, because I think the uh, the second thing that we have to do um, is, is break this idea that a light bulb went on in Florence in the year, I don't know, 1310, and uh, that marked the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of the Renaissance. And uh, I, so the Renaissance people have started to talk about early modern instead of Renaissance. Um, and, and that to me is, is just as worrisome if we're going to talk about chronologies and taxonomies because they're still distinguishing themselves from the Middle Ages. And I think it, it seems to me that there is not uh, that break from the end of the Middle Ages into the 15th and 16th centuries and that the other solution to the problem of how to talk about the Middle Ages is to make it clear that we're still living in them. Um, our attitudes to women emerge out of the Middle Ages. They don't emerge out of the earlier periods. They come uh, fully developed in the Middle Ages. Our attitudes to the nation state, you know, as Patrick Geary has recently argued, and um, are, are, are medieval. Um, so we have to point out the continuity and stop allowing people to instantiate the break, um, I think. Thank you. Um, então, ela diz que para não, temos duas, pelo menos duas formas de tentar de não cair nesse dilema onde a diferença entre estudos medievais e medievalismo nos deixa uh, fora do mundo do mundo contemporâneo, a primeira é, é encontrar formas que a Idade Média e os estudos medievais sejam menos assustadores. É verdade que temos que saber toda uma série de conhecimentos, latim, paleografia, etc., que é, são talvez assustadores, mas que temos que deixar de ser tão snobs e, e ter tanta sensação de, de, de pride. Agora eu vou precisar... Clínio, deixar de ficar tão orgulhosos disso, temos que parar, para não ficar de fora do mundo como se fôssemos separados do que está acontecendo. E a outra via é acabar com a ideia que eh, a, o Renascimento começa em algum momento e acaba com a Idade Média e temos então a modernidade, começamos a, a, a história moderna aqui, até os, eh, os acadêmicos da, dessa era que estão começando a se chamar de eh, era moderna, primeira era moderna, não sei como chamam vocês no Brasil, modernidade, né? primeira modernidade, é justamente uma forma que está também mantendo essa separação completa, como se uh, não houvesse nenhum contato entre o que é a modernidade, nós agora, com uma Idade Média que fica completamente no passado, mas que eh, nós temos também que fazer, de que clarificar isso para nós, temos falado disso em outros, eh, outras formas, depois eu falo com, uhum. com a Jane, uh, mas que nossas, nossas atitudes, nossas formas uh, de, de viver ainda tem contatos, é uma continuidade com a Idade Média, nós pensamos nas mulheres, nos estudos de como são os gêneros, 
vindo da Idade Média, temos ideias sobre a nação, Estado, que também vem da Idade Média, e que essa é uma outra forma de manter essa continuidade, em vez de nos isolar como sendo antes do que tudo que estava passando na modernidade. Um, so, Jane, this is actually a very interesting aspect, and I was mentioning. Sorry, Nadia, you've, you've gone dark. <laughs> Nadia? Nadia? Uh, yeah, I believe she dropped again. Drop it, yeah. Okay. Um, thanks, Luis, for those comments in the chat. You're right. There's a real problem with my focus on a European Middle Ages as opposed to thinking about the, the how that works in Hispano-America and North America, too, um, and Australia and New Zealand. So, yes, there's we, we have to think carefully about how we construct those. Yeah, because I, I think... Um, me and Professor Colini, we have discussed a lot about how, how the, the, the long the idea of the long Middle Ages as proposed by Jacques Le Goff and, and some others, yeah. how, how that's the dangerous, the colonial as well. Although it can be good for some things, so it's, it's one of those things, uh, use it with caution, but, but I don't think we have much time to, to continue this debate, although it, yeah. it would be a very interesting one. It yeah. would, yes. Um, so thank you so much. This has been really interesting. Um, I'm, I'm amazed by Nadia's ability to translate. It's just astonishing how yeah. she can do that. Me <laughs> too. It's, it's amazing. I, I, I have, I, I did this before, like translating a, a guest, and I had a much harder time translating because it, it just takes too long, and, and she's very quick, which is she impressive. Does, she makes me sound smarter than I am, so I'm, I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, thank you, Jane. Um, thank you in the name of, of Linhas and for, for accepting the, this invitation and joining us here today. It was a marvelous talking to you. Uh, it, oh, really? Wait uh, a little. Ah, okay. Hi. I will say, Nadia, come back. <laughs> oh. I've, I've been saying that uh, you've you've made me sound smarter than I am, Nadia. So thank you very much for your translations. Oh, it's it's been a, a pleasure to have you. Thank you really very much for uh, for agreeing and for uh, giving us all this time to talk with you and and ask you all these pesky questions uh, that we're all really interested in and we can want to continue um, asking and and talking about. So thank you very much. Yeah, I think we should. And if anybody wants to get in touch with me, um, my email is mjtoswel at euwo.ca. And I'm happy to help. If there's something I can do that will help your career, just get in touch. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, it's... Nadia, é incrível como você consegue falar vários idiomas e fazer uma tradução perfeita em português. Realmente, parabéns. Não, sério, sério. É, é, de, é de dar boa inveja. Desculpa, mas é realmente incrível isso. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.